This is the Lex Free Podcast, where we abridge the Lex Podcast with love by replacing everything Lex says with a pleasant guitar strum. Enjoy. They're going on our heads, yeah. And oh. they will place it on our heads for proper alignment. Does this support giant heads? Because I kind of have a giant head. <laughs> Is this, is is, just are you giant saying headphone? as like an ego, or are you saying both, physically both? both? Okay, I'm gonna drop it on. That is it. That is definitely a, a brain interface <laughs> that has a lot of blind spots. It has some blind spots. Yeah, psychotherapy. That's right. All right. Are we recording? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're good. All right. So Lex, the objective of this, I'm going to tell you some jokes and your objective is to not smile, which as a Russian, you should have an edge. Make the motherland proud. I gotcha. Okay. Let's hear the jokes. Lex, and this is from the Colonel crew. We've been working on a device that can read your mind and we would love to see your thoughts. Is that the joke? That's the opening. Okay. If if I'm if I'm seeing the muscle activation correctly on your on your lips, you're not going to do well on this. Let's see. All right, here here comes the first. I'm screwed. Here comes the first one. Lex, what goes through a potato's brain? <laughs> I got already failed. That's the hilarious opener. Okay. What? Tater thoughts. What kind of fish performs brain surgery? I don't know. A neural surgeon. <laughs> <laughs> and so we're getting data of everything that's happening in my brain right now? Lifetime, yeah. We're getting activation patterns of your entire cortex. I'm gonna try to do better. I let it out all the parts where I left. And Photoshop you, a serious face over me. You can recover. Yeah, all right. Lex, what do scholars eat when they're hungry? I don't know what. Academia nuts. That was a pretty good one. So what we'll do is, so you're wearing Colonel Flow, which is an interface built uh, using technology called spectroscopy. So it's similar to what we wear wearables on the wrist using light. So using LiDAR, as you know, and we're using that to image, it's a functional imaging of brain activity. And so as your neurons fire electrically and, and uh, chemically, it creates uh, blood oxygenation levels. We're measuring that. And so in, you'll see in the reconstructions we do for you, you'll see your activation patterns in your brain as throughout this entire time we are wearing it. So in the reaction to the jokes and as we were sitting here talking, and so it's a, we're moving towards a real time feed of your cortical brain activity. There's 52 modules and each module has one laser and six sensors. And they're, the sensors fire uh, in about 100 picoseconds and then the photons scatter and absorb in your brain. And then a few go in, a few come back out, uh, they, a bunch go in, then a few come back out and we sense those photons and then we do the reconstruction for the activity. Overall, there's about a thousand plus channels that are sampling your activity. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So people are accustomed to being in big systems like fMRI where there's 120 decibel sounds and you're in a, in a claustrophobic encasement in, in or EEG, which is just painful or surgery. And so, yes, I agree that this is a convenient option to be able to just put on your head. It measures your brain activity in the contextual environment you choose. So if we want to have it during a podcast, or if we want to be at home in a business setting, so we, it's freedom to be where to record your brain activity in the setting that you choose. That's right. So we, we built this 
this version of the mechanical design to accommodate most adult heads. What a cool perspective. I hadn't thought about that of feeling understood. Yeah. Heard. De yeah, heard deeply by the mechanical system that is recording your brain activity vers yeah. versus the human that you're engaging with, that your yeah. mind immediately goes to that there's this dimensionality and depth of understanding yeah. of this software system, which you're intimately familiar with. And now you're able to communicate with this system in ways that you couldn't before. Yeah, I feel heard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I guess what's interesting about this is your intuitions are spot on. Most people have intuitions about brain interfaces that they've grown up with this idea of people moving cursors on the screen or typing or changing the channel or skipping a song. It's primarily been anchored on control. And I think the more relevant understanding of brain interfaces or neuroimaging is that it's a measurement system. And once you have numbers for a given thing, a seemingly endless number of possibilities emerge around that of what to do with those numbers. I'm curious, what is your reaction? What, what comes to mind when you put that on your head? What does it mean to you and what possibilities emerge and what significance might it have? I mean, I'm curious where your orientation is at. What I heard you say is you have an entirety of lived experience, some of which you can communicate in words and in body language, some of which you feel internally, which cannot be captured in those communication modalities. And yeah. that this measurement system captures both the things you can try to articulate in words, maybe in a lower dimensional space, using one word, for example, to communicate focus, yeah. when it really may be represented in a 20 dimensional space of this particular kind of focus, yeah. and that this information is being captured. So it's a closer representation to the entirety of your experience captured in a dynamic fashion that is not just a static image of your conscious experience. If you think about that second thing you said about the science of the brain, most, we've done a pretty good job, like we, the human race has done a pretty good job figuring out how to quantify the things around us from distant uh, stars to calories and steps and our genome. So we can measure and quantify pretty much everything in the known universe except for our minds. And we can do these one-offs if we're going to get an fMRI scan or uh, do something with a low res EEG system, but we haven't done this at population scale. Mm -hmm. And so if you think about human thought or human cognition is probably the single law, uh, largest raw input material into society at any given moment. It's our conversations with, our, with ourselves and with other people and we have this this raw input that we can't haven't been able to measure yet yeah and if you when i think about it through that frame it's remarkable it's almost like we live in this wild wild west of unquantified communications within ourselves and between each other when everything else has been grounded I me mean, for example i know if, if i buy an appliance at the at the store or on, on a website I don't need to look at the measurements on the appliance to make sure it can fit through my door. That's an engineered system of appliance manufacturing and, and construction. Everyone's agreed upon engineering standards. And we don't have engineering standards around cognition. It's not a for, it has not entered as a formal engineering discipline that enables us to scaffold in society with everything else we're doing, including consuming news, our relationships, politics, economics, education, all the above. And so to me, the, the most significant contribution that kernel technology has to offer would be the formal, uh, the introduction of the formal engineering of cognition as it relates to everything else in society. This has been 
one of the most significant challenges of building kernel and kernel wouldn't exist if I wasn't able to fund it initially by myself. Because when I engage in conversations with investors, the immediate thought is what is the killer app? And of course, I understand that heuristic. That's what they're looking at is they're looking to de-risk. Is the product solved? Is there a customer base? Are people willing to pay for it? How does it compare to competing options? And in the case with brain interfaces, when I started the company, there was no known path to even build a technology that could potentially become mainstream. Yes. And then once we figured out the technology, we could even we could commence having conversations with investors and it became, what is a killer app? And so what has been, so I, I funded the first $53 million of the company and to raise the round of funding, the first one we did, I spoke to 228 investors. One said yes. It was remarkable. And it was mostly around this concept around what is a killer app. And so internally, the way we think about it is we think of the the go-to-market strategy much more like the Drake equation, where if we can build technology that has the characteristics of, it has the data quality is high enough, it meets some certain threshold, cost, accessibility, comfort, it can be worn in contextual environments. If it meets the criteria of being a mass market device, then the responsibility that we have is to figure out how to create the algorithm that enables hu the human to enable uh, humans to then find value with it. Okay. So it so the analogy is is like brain interfaces are like early '90s of the internet. Is you you want to populate an ecosystem with a certain number of devices. You want a certain number of people who play around with them, who do experiments of certain data collection parameters. You want to encourage certain mistakes from experts and non-experts. These are all critical elements that ignite discovery. And so, we believe we've ac accomplished the first objective of building technology that reaches those thresholds. And now it's the Drake equation component of how do we try to generate 20 years of value discovery in a two or three year time period? How do we compress that? Yeah, no, it's interesting. I, I actually regret now having called attention to this, I regret having used that word in this conversation because mm -hmm. it's something I would not normally do. I, I used it in order to create a bridge of shared understanding of how others would, what terminology others would use. Ideas. We've begun to play a fun game internally where when we have these discussions and we, we begin cir circling around this concept of, does anybody have an idea? Does anyone have intuitions? And if we see the conversation starting to, to veer in that direction, we flag it and say, human intuition alert, stop it. And yes. so we, we really want to focus on the algorithm of there's a natural process of human discovery mm. that, that when you populate a system with devices and you give people the opportunity to play around with it in expected and unexpected ways, we are thinking that is a much better system of discovery than us exercising intuitions. And it's interesting. We're also seeing a few neuroscientists who have been, uh, have been talking to us where I was speaking to this one young associate professor. And I approached a conversation and said, hey, we have these five data streams that we're pulling off. When you hear that, what weighted value do you add to each data source? Like, which one do you think is going to be valuable for your objectives and, and which one's not? Yeah. And he said, I don't care. Just give me the data. All I care about is my machine learning model. Yeah. But importantly, he did not have a theory of mind. He did not come to the table and say, I think the brain operates you know, in this way and these reasons or have these, these functions. He didn't care. He just wanted the data. And we're seeing that more and more that certain people are devaluing human intuitions for good reasons, as we've seen in machine learning over, over the past couple of years. And we're doing the same in, in our value creation uh, market strategy. That's right. Through yep. humans playing around with them. Our well. objective is to create the most valuable data collection system of the brain ever. And with that, then applying all the best tools of machine learning and other techniques to extract out, you know, to, to try to find insight. 
but yes, our, our objective is really to systematize the discovery process because we, we can't put definite timeframes on discovery. The brain is complicated and, and science is not a business strategy. And so we really need to figure out how to, this is the difficulty of bringing, bringing, you know, technology like this to market. And it's why most of the time it just ling it languishes in academia, academia for quite some time, but we hope that, uh, we will over, you know, cross over and, and make this mainstream in the coming years. If I think through the things that have changed my life most significantly over the past few years, when I started wearing a wearable on my wrist that would give me data about my heart rate, heart rate variability, respiration mm -hmm. rate, uh, metabolic approximations, etc. For the first time in my life, I had access to information, uh, sleep patterns yes. that were highly impactful. They, they told me, for example, if I eat close to bedtime, I'm not going to get deep sleep mm. and not getting deep sleep means you have all these follow on consequences in life. And so it opened up this window of understanding of myself that I cannot self introspect and deduce these things. This is information that was available to be acquired but it just wasn't, I would have to get an expensive sleep study. Then it's an end like one night and that's not good enough to look at, to run all my trials. And so if you look just at the information that one can acquire on their wrist, and now you're applying it to the entire cortex on the brain and you say, what kind of information could we acquire? It opens up a whole new universe of possibilities. Uh, for example, we did this internal study at Kernel where I wore a prototype device and we were measuring the cognitive effects of sleep. So I had a device measuring my sleep. I performed with 13 of my, of my coworkers. We performed four cognitive tasks over uh, 13 sessions. And we focused on reaction time, impulse control, uh, short-term memory, and then a resting state task. And we, with mine, we found, for example, that my impulse control was independently correlated with my sleep outside of behavioral measures of my ability to play the game. The point of the study was I had the brain study I did at Kernel confirmed my life experience yeah. that if I, my deep sleep determined whether or not I would be able to resist temptation the following day. Hmm. And my brain data showed that as one example. And so if you start thinking, if you actually have uh, data on yourself, on your, on your entire cortex, and you can control the, the settings, I think there's probably an, an uh, a large number of things that we could discover about ourselves, very, very small and very, very big. Uh, just for example, like when you read news, what's going on? In all of your examples, it's interesting that everyone who's designed an experience for you, so whether it be the meditation app or the deep work or the, all the things you mentioned, they constructed this product with a certain number of knowns. Yeah. Now, what if we expanded the number of knowns by 10X or 20X or 30X? They would reconstruct their product, co-incorporate those knowns. So it'd be, yeah. and so this is the dimensionality that I think is the promising aspect is that people will be able to uh, use this quantification, use this information to build more effective products and this is, I'm not talking about better products to advertise to you or manipulate you. I'm talking about uh, our focus is helping people, individuals have this contextual awareness and this quantification, and then to engage with others who are seeking to improve people's lives. That the, the objective is, is betterment across ourselves individually and also uh, with each other. I'm imagining if you have you have your neurome, this is Lex, and you there's a statistical representation of you and you engage with the app and it says, Lex, you're best to engage with this meditation uh, exercise in the following settings. Uh, at this time of day, after eating this kind of food or not eating, fasting, yeah. Yeah. with this level of blood glucose and, and this uh, kind of night sleep. Yep. But all these data combined to give you this contextually relevant mm -hmm. experience, just like we do with our sleep. We, you've optimized your entire life based upon what information you can acquire and know about yourself. And so the question is, 
how much do we really know of the exactly. things going on around us? And, and I would venture to guess in my own, my life, life experience, I capture, my self-awareness captures an extremely small percent of the things that actually influence my conscious and unconscious experience. I agree with you. I've actually employed the same strategy. I, I fired my mind entirely from being responsible for constructing my diet. And so I started doing a program where I now track over 200 biomarkers every 90 days. And it captures, of course, the things you would expect like cholesterol, but also DNA methylation and all kinds of things that, that, about my body, all the processes that make up me. And then I let that data generate the shopping list. Hmm. And so I never actually ask my mind what it wants. It's entirely what my body is reporting that it wants. And so I call this goal alignment within Brian. Mm -hmm. And there's 200 plus actors that I'm currently asking their opinion of. And so I'm asking my liver, how are you doing? And it's expressing via the biomarkers. And so then I construct that diet and I only eat those foods until my next testing round. And that has changed my life more than I think anything else because in the demotion of my conscious mind, that I gave primacy to my entire life. It led me astray because like you're saying, the mind then goes out into the world and it navigates the dozens of different dietary regimens people put together in books. And it's all has their, all has their supporting science in certain contextual settings, but it's not N of one. And like you're saying, this di dietary really is an N of one. These, what people have published scientifically, of course, can be used uh, for, nice groundings, but it changes when you get to an end of one level. And so that's what gets me excited about brain interfaces is if you, if I could do the same thing for my brain, where I can stop asking my conscious mind for its advice or for its decision-making, which is flawed. And I'd rather just look at this data that, and it, I've, I've never had better health markers in my life than when I stopped <laughs> actually asking myself to be in charge of it. And <laughs> Yeah, the, the very the tests I do. Yes. So it includes uh, a complete blood panel. I do a microbiome test. I do a food inflammation, uh, a diet induced inflammation. So I look for like cytokine expressions. So foods that produce inflammatory reactions. Uh, I look at my neuroendocrine system. So I look at all my neurotransmitters. Uh, I do. Uh, yeah, there's several micronutrient tests to see how I'm looking at the very various nutrients. <laughs> a temporal sampling over some duration of time. So I'll think through how I feel over a week, over a month, or over three months. I don't do a temporal sampling of if I'm at the grocery store in front of a cereal box and be like, you know what, Captain Crunch is probably the right thing for me today because I'm feeling like I need a little fun in my life. Yeah. And so it's a temporal sampling. <laughs> if the data set's large enough, then I, I smooth out the function of my natural oscillations of how I feel about life, where some days I may feel upset or depressed or down or whatever. And I don't want those moments to then rule my decision making. That's why the demotion happens. And it says, really, if you're looking at health over a 90 day period of time, all my 200 voices speak up on that interval. And they're all given voice to say, this is how I'm doing and this is what I want. And so it really is an accounting system for everybody. So that's why I think that if you think about the future of being human, there's two things I think that are really going on. One is the design, manufacturing, and distribution of intelligence is heading towards zero on a cost curve over a, over a certain design, over a certain time frame. But our ability to, you know, evolution produced us an intelligent, a form of intelligence. We are now designing our own intelligent systems. And the design, manufacturing, and distribution of that intelligence over a certain uh, time frame is going to go to a cost of zero. Design. So if that, that's going on, and then now in parallel to that, then you say, okay, what, what then happens if when that cost curve is heading to zero, our existence becomes a goal alignment problem, a goal alignment function. And so the same thing I'm doing where I'm doing goal alignment within myself of these 200 biomarkers where I'm saying when when Brian exists on a daily basis and this entity is deciding what to eat and what to do and et cetera, 
it's not just my conscious mind, which is opining, it's 200 biological processes, and there's a whole bunch of more voices involved. So in that equation, we're going to increasingly automate the things that we spend high energy on today, because it's easier. And now we're going to then negotiate the terms and conditions of intelligent life. Now we say conscious existence because we're biased, because that's what we have, but it will be the largest computational exercise in history because you're now doing goal alignment with planet earth, within yourself, with each other, within all the intelligent agents we're building, bots and other you know, voice assistants. You basically don't have a trillions and trillions of agents working on the negotiation of goal alignment. Yeah, this this is in fact true. Uh, and what was the second thing? That was it. So the, the, the cost, the design, manufacturing, distribution of intelligence going to zero, which then means what's really going on? What are we really doing? We're negotiating the terms and conditions of existence. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's unsurprising that a new thing comes into the sphere of human consciousness. Humans identify the foreign object, in this case, artificial intelligence. Our amygdala fires up and says, scary, foreign, we should be apprehensive about this. Mm -hmm. And so it, it makes sense from a biological perspective that humans, for the, the knee-jerk reaction is fear. What I don't think has been properly weighted with that is that we are the first generation of intelligent beings on this earth that has been able to look out over their expected lifetime and see there is a real possibility of evolving into entirely novel forms of consciousness. Yeah. So different that it would be totally unrecognizable to us today. We don't have words for it. We can't hint at it. We can't point at it. We can't, you can't look in the sky and see that thing that is shining. We're going to go up there. You, you cannot even create an aspirational statement about it. And instead we've had this knee jerk reaction of fear about everything that could go wrong. But in my estimation, this should be the defining aspiration of all intelligent life on earth that, that we would aspire that basically every generation surveys the landscape of possibilities that are afforded given the technological, cultural, and other contextual situation that they're in. We're in this context. We haven't yet identified this and said, this is unbelievable. We should carefully think this thing through, not just of mitigating the things that would wipe us out, but like we have this potential. And so we just haven't given voice to it, even though it's within this realm of possibilities. That's a complicated question. I, I would have answered it differently in different times of my life. I, you know, I had chronic depression for 10 years. And so in that 10 year time period, I desperately wanted lights to be off. And the thing that made it even worse is I was in a religious, I'd, I was born into a religion it was the only reality I ever understood. And it, it's difficult to articulate to people when you're born into that kind of reality and it's the only reality you're exposed to, you are literally blinded to the existence of other realities because it's so much the, the in-group, out-group thing. And so in that situation, it was not only that I desperately wanted lights out forever, it was that I couldn't have lights out forever. It was that there was an afterlife. And this afterlife had this system that would either penalize or or uh, reward you for your behaviors. And so it's almost like this, this indescribable hopelessness of not only being in hopeless despair of not wanting to exist, but then also being forced to be to exist. And so there was a duration of my time uh, of a duration of life where I'd say, like, yes, I have no remorse for lights being out and actually want it more than anything in the entire world. There are other times where I'm looking out at the future and I say, this is an opportunity for future uh, evolving human conscious experience that is beyond 
my ability to understand and it, and I jump out of bed and I race to work and I, I can't think about anything else. But I, I think the, the reality for me is, I don't know what it's like to be in your head, but in my head, when I wake up in the morning, I don't say, good morning, Brian, I'm so happy to see you. Like, I'm sure you're just gonna be beautiful to me today. You're not gonna make a huge long list of everything you should be anxious about. You're not gonna repeat that list to me 400 times. You're not gonna have me re uh, relive all the regrets I've made in life. I'm sure you're not doing any of that. You're just gonna just help me along all day long. I mean, it's a brutal environment in my brain. Mm -hmm. And we've just become normalized to this environment that we just accept that this is what it means to be human. But if we look at it, if we try to muster as much soberness as we can about the realities of being human, it's brutal, uh, if it is for me. And so am I sad that the brain may be off one day? Hmm. You know, it depends on the contextual setting. Like how am I, w at what moment are you asking me that? And that's, it's, my mind is so fickle. And this is why, again, I don't trust my conscious mind. I have been given realities. I, I was given a religious reality that was a video game. And then I figured out it was not a real reality. And then I lived in a depressive reality, which delivered this terrible hopelessness. That wasn't a real reality. Then I discovered uh, behavioral psychology and I figured out how biased, uh, 188 chronicle biases and how my brain is distorting reality all the time. I have gone from one reality to another. I don't trust reality. I don't trust realities that are given to me. And so to make try to make a decision on what I value or not value that future state, I don't trust my response. Yes, I assume that whatever my conscious mind delivers up to my awareness is wrong o on pond landing. And I just need to figure out where it's wrong, how it's wrong, how wrong it is, and then try to correct for it as best I can. But I, I assume that on impact, it's, it's mistaken in some critical ways. Two things. One, that those depressive states are biochemical states. It's not you. And the suggestions that these things, that this state delivers to you about suggestion of the hopelessness of life or, or the meaninglessness of it or that you should hit the eject button, that's a false reality. Yeah. And that it's when I, I completely understand the rational decision to commit suicide. There's, it is not lost on me at all that that is, a, and that is an irrational situation. But the key is when you're in that situation and those thoughts are landing, to be able to say, thank you, you're not real. <laughs> I know you're not yeah. real. Yeah. And so I'm in a situation where for whatever reason, I'm having this, this uh, neurochemical state, but that state can be altered. And so it, again, it, it goes back to the realities of, of the difficulties of, of being human. And like when I was trying to solve my depression, I tried literally, ev you name it, I tried it systematically and nothing would fix it. And so this is what gives me hope with brain interfaces, for example, like, could I have numbers on my brain? Can I see what's going on? Because I, I go to the doctor and it's like, how do you feel? I don't know, terrible. <laughs> Like on a scale from one to 10, how bad do you want to commit suicide? 10. <laughs> You're like, okay. This goes back to the discussion we're having of human cognition is in volume, the largest input of raw material into society. Yeah. And it's not quantified. We have no bearings on it. And so we just, you wonder we both articulated some of the challenges we have in our own mind. And it's likely that others would say, I have something similar. Yeah. And you wonder when you look at society, what, how does that contribute to all the other compounded problems that we're experiencing? How does that blind us to the, uh, the opportunities we could be looking at? And so it, it really, it has this potential distortion effect on reality that just makes everything worse. And I hope if we can put some, if we can ass assign some numbers to these things, just to get our bearings 
so we're aware of what's going on, if we could find greater stabilization in how we conduct our lives and how we build society, it, it might be the thing that enables us to scaffold. Because uh, we've really, again, we've done a, humans have done a fantastic job systematically scaffolding technology and science and institutions. It's humans, it's our, it's our own selves which we have not been able to scaffold. It's, it's, we, are the, we are the one part of this intelligence infrastructure that remains unchanged. To me, what baselines this conversation is, imagine if, you, if we were interested in the health of your heart and we started and said, okay, Lex, self-introspect, tell me, how's the health of your heart? And you sit there and you close your eyes and you think, feels all right, like things seem, things feel okay. And then you went to the cardiologist and the cardiologist like, hey Lex, you know, tell me how you feel. And you're like, well actually, what I'd really like you to do is do an EKG and a blood panel and look at arterial plaques and let's look at my cholesterol. And you know, there's like five to 10 studies you would do. Mm -hmm. They would then give you this report and say, here's the quantified health of your heart. Mm -hmm. Now with this data, I'm going to prescribe the following regime of exercise and maybe I'll put you on a statin, like, uh, et cetera. But the, the protocol is based upon this data. You would think the cardiologist is out of their mind if they just gave you a bottle of statins based upon you're like, well, I think something's kind of wrong. And they're just, just kind of experiment and see what happens. Yeah. But that's what we do with our mental health today. So you're, it's, it's kind of absurd. And so if you look at psychedelics uh, to have again, to be able to measure the brain and get a baseline state, and then to measure during a psychedelic experience and post a psychedelic experience and then do it longitudinally, you now have a quantification of what's going on. And so you could then pose questions, what molecule is appropriate? At what dosages? Uh, at what frequency? In what contextual environment? What happens when I have this diet with this molecule with this experience? All the experimentation you do when you have good sleep data or HRV. And so that's what I think happens what we could potentially do with psychedelics is we could add this level of sophistication that is not in the industry currently. And it may improve the outcomes people experience. It may improve the safety and efficacy. And so that's what I hope we are able to achieve. And it would transform mental health because we would finally have numbers to work with to base on ourselves. And then if you think about it, we when we talk about things related to the mind, we talk about the modality. We use words like meditation or psychedelics or, or something else because we can't talk about a marker in the brain. We can't use a word to say, we, we can't talk about cholesterol. We don't talk about plaque in the arteries. We don't talk about HRV. And so if we have numbers, then the solutions get mapped to numbers instead of the modalities being the thing we talk about. Meditation just does good things in a crude fashion. Zeroth principles are building blocks. First principles are understanding of system laws. So if you take, for example, like in Sherlock Holmes, he's a first principles thinker. So he says, once you've eliminated the impossible, anything that remains, however improbable, is true. Mm -hmm. Whereas Dirk Gently, the holistic detective by Douglas Adams says, I don't like eliminating the impossible. So when someone says from a first principles perspective and they, they're they trying to assume the fewest number of things within a given time frame. And so when I, after Braintree Venmo, I set my mind to the question of what single thing can I do that would maximally increase the probability that the human race thrives beyond what we can even imagine. And I found that in my conversations with others, in, in the books I read, in my own deliberations, I had a missing piece of the puzzle because I didn't feel like uh, over, yeah, I didn't feel like the future could be deduced from first principles thinking. Mm. And that's when I, I read the book, Zero, a, a Biography of a Dangerous Idea. Mm -hmm. And I- It's I, a really good book, by the way. It's, yeah. I think it's my favorite book I've ever read. It's also a really interesting number, zero. And I, I, I wasn't aware 
that the number zero had to be discovered. I didn't realize that it caused a revolution in philosophy and the end it just tore up math and it tore up. I mean, it, it builds modern society, but it, it wrecked everything in its way. It was an unbelievable disruptor and it was so difficult for society to get their heads around it. Yeah. And so zero is of course the a representation of a zeroth principle thinking, which is it's the caliber and consequential nature of an idea. And so when you talk about what kind of ideas have civilization transforming properties, oftentimes they fall in the zeroth category. And so in thinking this through, I, I was wanting to find a quantitative structure on how to think about these zeroth principles. And that's, so I came up with that to be a, a coupler with first principles thinking. And so now it's a staple as part of how I think about the world and the future. Yeah, life constraints favor first principles thinking because it, it enables faster action with higher probability of success. Mm -hmm. Pursuing zeroth principle optionality is expensive and uncertain. And so in a society constrained by resources, time and money and a desire for social status, accomplishment, et cetera, it minimizes zeroth principle thinking. But, but the reason why I think zeroth principle thinking should be a staple of our shared cognitive infrastructure is if you look through the history of the past couple thousand years, and let's just say we arbitrarily we subjectively try to assess what is a zero level, zero level idea. And we say, how many have occurred on what time scales and what were the contextual settings for it? I would argue that if you look at AlphaGo, when it, it played Go from another dimension, with the, the human Go players, when it saw AlphaGo's moves, it attributed it to like playing with an alien, playing uh, Go with, uh, with AlphaGo being from another dimension. Mm -hmm. And so if you say computational intelligence has an attribute of introducing zero like insights, then if you say, what is going to be the occurrence of zeros in society going forward? And you could reasonably say probably a lot more than have occurred and probably more at a faster pace. So then if you say, what happens if you have this computational intelligence throughout society that the manufacturing, design, and distribution of intelligence is now going to heading towards zero. You have an increased number of zeros being produced with a tight connection between humans and computers. That's when I got to a point and said, we cannot predict the future with first principles thinking. We can't, that cannot be our imagination set. It can't be uh, our sole anchor in this situation that basically the future of our conscious existence, 20, 30, 40, 50 years, is probably a zero. <laughs> yeah, something that is currently not a building block of our shared conscious existence, either in the form of knowledge. Uh, yeah, it's, it's currently not manifest yeah. in what we acknowledge. <laughs> Or for example, like Einstein, that was a zeroth, I would categorize it as a zeroth principle insight. You mean general relativity, space time? Yeah, space the, time. The yep. Yep. That basically that the building upon what Newton had done and said, yes, also, and it just changed the fabric of our understanding of yeah. reality. And so that was unexpected. It, it existed. Yeah. We just, uh, it became, it became part of our awareness and the moves alpha go made existed. It just came into our awareness. And so it, to your point, there's this question of what do we know and what don't we know? Do we think we know 99% of all things, or do we think we know 0.001% of all things? And that goes back to known knowns, known knowns and unknown unknowns. And first principles and zero principle thinking gives us a quantitative framework to say, there's no way for us to mathematically try to create probabilities for these things. Therefore, it would be helpful 
if they were just part of our standard thought processes, because it may encourage different behaviors in what we do individually, collectively as a society, what we aspire to, what we talk about, the possibility sets we imagine. I agree with you. And I think going back to our experience together with brain interfaces on, you could imagine if we get to a certain level of maturity. So first let's take the, the inverse of this. So you and I text back and forth and we're sending each other emojis. That has a certain amount of information transfer rate as we're communicating with each other. And so in our communication with people via email and text and whatnot, we've taken the bandwidth of human interaction, the information transfer rate, and we've reduced it. We have less social cues. We have less information to work with. There's a lot, a lot more opportunity for misunderstanding. So that is altering the conscious experience between two individuals. Mm -hmm. And if we add brain interfaces to the equation, let's imagine now we amplify the dimensionality of our communications. That to me is what you're talking about, which is consciousness engineering. Perhaps I understand you with dimensions. So maybe I understand your hap. When you look at the cup mm -hmm. and you experience that happiness, you can tell me you're happy. And I then do theory of mine and say, I can imagine what it might be like to be Lex and feel happy about seeing this cup. But if the interface could then quantify and give me a 50 vector space model and say, this is the version of happiness that Lex is experiencing mm -hmm. as he looks at this cup, then it would allow me potentially to have much greater empathy for you and understand you as a human of this is how you experience joy, yes. which is entirely unique from how I experience joy, even though we assumed ahead of time that we have, we're having some kind of similar experience. But I agree with you that the we do consciousness engineering today in everything we do. When we talk to each other, when we're building products, and that we're entering into a, an, a stage where it will be much more methodical and quantitative based and computational in how we go about doing it, which to me, I find encouraging because I think it creates better guardrails uh, for to create uh, ethical systems on uh, versus right now, I feel like it's really a wild, wild west on how these interactions are happening. Yeah, and it's funny you focus on human to human, but that this kind of data enables human to machine yes. interaction, which is what we're kind of talking about when we say engineering consciousness. And that will happen, of course. Let's flip that on its head. Let's right now we're putting humans as the central node. What if we gave GPT three a bunch of human brains and said, "Hey, GPT three, learn some manners." when you speak yeah, and run your algorithms on humans' brains and see how they respond. Uh, so you can be polite and so that you can be friendly and so that you can be conversationally appropriate. But to inverse it, to give our machines a training set in real time with closed loop feedback so that our machines were better equipped to uh, find their way through our society <laughs> in polite and kind and appropriate ways. I think we got off to a wrong start with the internet where the basic rules of play for the, for the company that be was, if you're a company, you can go out and get as much information on a person as you can find without their approval. And you can also do things to induce them to give you as much information. And you don't need to tell them what you're doing with it. You can do anything on the backside, you can make money on it, but the game is who can acquire the most information and devise the most clever schemes to do it. That was a bad starting place. And so we are in this period where we need to, rec we need to correct for that. And it need we need to say, first of all, the individual always has control over their data. It's not a free for all. It's not like a game of hungry hippo, but they can just go at it and grab as much as they want. So for example, when your brain data was recorded today, the first thing we did in the kernel app was you have control over your data. And so it's individual uh, consent, it's individual control, and then you can build up on top of that, but it has to be based upon some clear rules of play of everyone knows what's being collected, they know what's being done with it, and the person has control over it. So transparency and control. So everybody knows what does control look like? Me, my ability to delete the data That's if right. I want. Yeah, delete it, and to know uh, who it's being shared with under what you know what under what terms and conditions. We haven't reached that level 
of sophistication with our products of if if you say for example hey spotify please give me a customized playlist according to my neurom you know you could say you can have access to this vector space model but only for this duration of time and uh and then you've got to delete it we haven't gotten there to that level of sophistication but these are ideas we need to start talking about of how do you how would you actually structure permissions yeah and i think it creates a much more stable set for society to build where we understand the rules of play and people aren't vulnerable to being taken advantage it's not fair for an individual to be taken advantage of without their awareness with some other practice that some companies doing for their sole benefit and so hopefully we are going through a process now where we're correcting for these things and that it can be an economy wide shift that because really the, these are these are fundamentals we need to have in place i mean in, in the it's it's not unimaginable in the future the, the big technology companies have built a business based upon acquiring data about you that they can then create a view to model of you and sell that predictability. And so it's not unimaginable that you will create with a kernel device, for example, a more reliable predictor of you than they could. And that they're asking you for permission to complete their objectives and you're the one that gets to negotiate that with them and say, yeah. sure. But, but so it's not un, unimaginable that might be the case. Elon and I spoke about this a lot early on. We we met up, I had started Kernel, and he had an interest in brain interfaces as well. And we explored doing something together, him joining Kernel. And it, ultimately it wasn't the right move. And so he started Neuralink and I, I continued building Kernel. But it was interesting because we were both at this very early time where it wasn't certain what if there was a path to pursue if now was the right time to do something and then the technological choice of doing that. And so we were both, our starting point was looking at invasive technologies and I was building te uh, invasive technology at the time. Uh, that's ultimately where he's gone. Uh, a little less than a year after uh, Elon and I were engaged, I shifted kernel to do non-invasive. And we had this neuroscientist come to Colonel. We were talking about, he had been doing neurosurgery for 30 years, one of the most respected neuroscientists in the US. And we brought him to Colonel to figure out the ins and outs of his profession. Mm -hmm. And at the very end of our three hour conversation, he said, you know, every 15 or so years, a new technology comes along that changes everything. He said, it's probably already here. You just can't see it yet. And my jaw dropped. I thought, because I, I had spoken to Bob Greenberg, uh, who had built a uh, second sight first on the optical nerve, and then he did a core, uh, an array on the optical um, cortex. And then I also uh, became friendly with um, Neuropace, who does, who does the implants for seizure detection and remediation. And I saw in their, in their eyes what it was like to take something through an implantable device through for, for, for a 15 year run. They initially thought it was seven years and it ended up being 15 years and they thought it'd be a hundred million is, you know, 300, 400 million. And I really didn't want to build invasive technology. It was the only thing that appeared to be possible. But then once I spun up an internal effort to start looking at non-invasive options, we said, is there something here? Is there anything here that again, has the characteristics of it has the high quality data. It could be low cost. It could be accessible. Could it make brain interfaces mainstream? Mm. And so I did a bet the company move. We shifted from non-invasive to uh, invasive to non-invasive. So the answer is yes to that. There is something there that's possible. The, uh, the answer is we'll see. We've now built both technologies and they're now, you experience one of them today. We were apl applying we're now deploying it. So we're trying to figure out what value is really there, but I'd say it's it's really too early to express confidence, whether it's too, I think it's too early to assess which technological choice is the right one on what time scales. Yeah, because, time scales are really important here. Very right? important. Because yeah. if you look at the, like on the invasive side, there's so much activity going on right now of less invasive 
techniques to get at the neuron firings, which what, what Neuralink is building, it's possible that in 10, 15 years, when they're scaling that technology, other things have come along and you'd much rather do that, that then starts to clock again. It may not be the case. It may be the case that Neuralink has properly chosen the right technology mm -hmm. and that that's exactly where they want to be. Totally possible. And it's also possible that the paths we've chosen are non-invasive fall short for a variety of reasons. It's just, it's unknown. And so right now, the two technologies we chose, the analogy I'd give, to, give you to, to create a baseline of understanding is, if you think of it like the internet in the 90s, the internet became useful when people could do a dial-up connection. And then the paid, and then as, as, as bandwidth increased, so did the utility of that connection and so did the ecosystem improve. And so if you say what kernel flow uh, is going to give you a full screen on the picture of information, but so you're gonna be watching a movie, but the image is going to be blurred and the audio is gonna be muffled. Mm -hmm. So it has a lower resolution of coverage. A kernel flux, uh, our MEG technology is gonna give you the full movie in 1080p. Yeah. And Neuralink is gonna give you a circle on the screen of 4K. Yeah. And so each one has their pros and cons and uh, it's give and take. And so the decision I made at Kernel was that these two technologies, Flux and Flow, were basically the answer for the next seven years. Yeah. And that they would give rise to the ecosystem, which would become much more valuable than the hardware itself. And that we would just continue to improve on the hardware over time. And, you know, it's early days. So. Uh... It's wonderful to have someone else out there with us doing this, because yeah, if you if few. you look at brain interfaces, anything that's off the shelf right now is inadequate. It's had its run for a couple of decades. It's still in hacker communities. It hasn't gone to the mainstream. The room size machines are on their own path, but there is no answer right now of bringing brain interfaces mainstream, and so it both you know both they and us we've both spent over 100 million dollars and that's kind of what it takes to have a go at this because you need to build full stack i mean at kernel we are from the photon and the atom through the machine learning we have just under 100 people i think it's something like 36 37 phd's in these specialties in these areas that there's only a few people in the world who have these abilities mm -hmm. and that's what it takes to build next generation have to make an attempt at breaking into brain interfaces. And so we'll see over the next couple of years, whether it's the right time or whether we were both too early or whether something else comes along in seven to 10 years, which is the right thing that brings it mainstream. It's a fellow traveler. It's like at the beginning of the internet is how many companies are going to be invited to this new ecosystem like an endless number. Because if you think that the hardware just starts the process. And so, if you, okay, back to your initial example, if you take the Fitbit, for example, and you say, okay, now I can get measurements on the body. And what do we think the ultimate value of this device is going to be? What is the information transfer rate? And they were in the market for a certain duration of time and Google bought them for you know, two and a half billion dollars. They didn't have ancillary value add. There weren't people building on top of the, the Fitbit device. They also didn't have increased insight with additional data streams. So it's really just the device. If you look, for example, at Apple and the device they sell, you have value in the device that someone buys, but also you have everyone who's building on top of it. So you have this additional ecosystem value, and then you have additional data streams that come in, which increase the value of the product. Mm -hmm. And so if you say, if you look at the, the hardware as the instigator of value creation, mm -hmm. You know, over time, it what we've built may constitute five or ten percent of the value of the overall ecosystem, and that's what we really, really care about. What we're trying to do is kickstart the mainstream adoption of quantifying the brain, and the hardware just opens the door to say what kind of ecosystem could exist, mm. and that's why we the examples that are so relevant of the things you've outlined in your life. We hope I hope those things, the books people write the experiences people build, the conversations you have, your relationship with your AI systems. I hope those all are feeding on the insights built upon this ecosystem we've created 
to better your life. And so that's the thinking behind it. Again, with the Drake equation being the underlying uh, driver of value. And you know, the people at Kernel have joined not because we have certainty of success, but because we find it to be the most exhilarating opportunity we could ever pursue in this time uh, to be alive. I discovered payments by accident. As I was, when I was 21, I, I just returned from Ecuador uh, living among extreme poverty for two years. And I came back to the US and I was shocked by the opulence and the, of the United States. And I just thought this is, I couldn't believe it. And I decided I wanted to try to spend my life helping others. Like that was the, that was a life objective that I thought was worthwhile to pursue versus making money and whatever the case may be uh, for its own right. And so I decided in that moment that I was going to try to make enough money by the age of 30 to never have to work again. And then with some abundance of money, I could then choose to do things that might be beneficial to others, but may not meet the criteria of being you know, a, a standalone business. And so in that process, I started a, a few companies, had some small successes, had some fel uh, failures. In one of the endeavors, I was up to my eyeballs in debt, things were not going well, and I needed a part-time job to pay my bills. Mm -hmm. And so I, one day I saw in, in the paper in Utah where I was living, the 50 richest people in Utah. And I emailed each one of their assistants and said, you know, I, I'm young, I'm resourceful, I'll do anything. I just want to, I'm entrepreneurial. I tried to get a job that would be flexible and no one responded. And then I interviewed at a few dozen places. Nobody would even give me the time of day. Uh, like, it wouldn't want to take me seriously. And so finally, I it was on monster.com that I saw this job posting for credit card sales door to door. Commission. <laughs> I did not know the story. This is great. I love the head drop. That's exactly right. So it was. The I, low points to which we go in life. <laughs> so I, I responded and, you know, the person made an attempt at suggesting that they had some kind of standards that they would consider in hiring. But it's kind of like if you could fog a mirror, like you come and do this because it's a hundred percent commission. And so I started walking up and down the street in my community selling credit card processing. And so what you learn immediately in doing that is if you, you walk into a business, first of all, the business owner is typically there it's, and you walk in the door and they can tell by how you're dressed or how you walk, whatever their pattern recognition is. Mm -hmm. And they just hate you immediately. It's like, stop wasting my time. I really am trying to get stuff done. I don't want to listen to a sales pitch. And so you have to overcome the initial get out. And then once you engage, when you, when you say the word credit card processing, the person's like, I already hate you because I have been taken advantage of dozens of times because you all are yeah. weasels. And yeah. so I had to figure out an algorithm to get past all those different conditions because I was still working on my other startup uh, for the majority of my time. So I was doing this part-time. And so I figured out that the industry really was built on people uh, it, it, on deceit, uh, basically people promising things that, that were not reality. And so I'd walk into a business, I'd say, look, I would give you a hundred dollars. I'd put a hundred dollar bill and say, I'll give you a hundred dollars for three minutes of your time. If you don't say yes to what I'm saying, I'll give you a hundred dollars. And then he usually crack a smile and say, okay, like, what, what do you got for me, son? And so I'd sit down and I just open my book and I'd say, here's the credit card industry. Here's how it works. Here are the players. Here's what they do. Here's how they deceive you. Here's what I am. I'm no different than anyone else. I, it's like, you're going to process your credit card. You're going to get the money in the account. You're just going to get a clean statement. You're going to have someone who answers the, the call when someone asks and, you know, just like the basic, like you're okay. Yeah. And people started saying yes. And then of course I went to the next business and be like, you know, Joe and Susie and whoever said yes to. And so I built the social proof structure and I became the number one salesperson out of 400 people nationwide doing this. And I worked, you know, half time still doing this other startup. And that's I, a brilliant strategy, by the way, it's very well, very well strategized and executed. I did it for nine months. And at the time my customer base was making, was generating around, I think it was six, if I remember correctly, $62,504 a month mm -hmm. were the overall revenues. I thought, wow, that's amazing. If I built that as my own company, I would just make $62,000 a month of income passively with these merchants processing yeah. credit cards. So I thought, hmm. And so uh, 
that's when I thought I'm going to create a company. And so then I started Braintree and the idea was the online world was broken because PayPal had, a, uh, had been acquired by eBay around, I think, 2000, 1999 or 2000. And eBay had not innovated much with PayPal. So it, it basically sat still for seven years as the software world moved along. And then Authorize.net was also a company that was relatively stagnant. So you basically had software engineers who wanted modern payment tools, but there were none available for them. And so they just dealt with software they didn't like. And so with Braintree, I thought the entry point is to build software that engineers will love. And if we can find the entry point via software and make it easy and beautiful and just a magical experience and then provide customer service on top of that that was easy, that would be great. What I was really going after for though was it was PayPal. They were the only company in payments making money hmm. uh, because they because they had the relationship with eBay early on. People created a PayPal account. They'd fund their account with their checking account versus their credit cards. And then when they'd use PayPal to pay a merchant, PayPal had a cost of payment of zero versus if you have uh, coming from a credit card, you have to pay the bank the fees. So PayPal's margins were 3% on a transaction versus a typical payments company, which may be a nickel or a penny or a dime or something mm -hmm. like that. And so I knew, I knew PayPal really was the model to replicate, but a bunch of companies had tried to do that. They tried to come in and build a two-sided marketplace. So get consumers to fund the checking account and then merchants to accept it. Mm -hmm. But they'd all failed because building a two-sided marketplace is very hard at the same time. So my plan was I'm going to build a company and get the best merchants in the whole world to use our service. Then in year five, I'm going to have, I'm going to acquire a consumer payments company and I'm going to bring the two together. Wow. And yeah, this is the plan I presented uh, when I was at the University of Chicago. And weirdly, it happened exactly like that. So four, four years in, our customer base included Uber, Airbnb, GitHub, uh, 37 Signals, not Basecamp. We had a fantastic collection of companies that represented the fastest growing, some of the fastest growing tech companies in the world. And then we met up with Venmo and they had done a remarkable job in building product. And then something very counterintuitive, which is make public your private financial transactions, which people previously thought were something that should be hidden from others. And we acquired Venmo. And at that point, we now had, we replicated the model because now people could fund their Venmo account with their checking account, keep money in the account. And then you could just plug Venmo in as a form of payment. And so I think PayPal saw that, that we were getting the best merchants in the world. We had people using Venmo. They were both the up and coming millennials at the time who had so much influence online. And so they came in and offered us uh, an attractive number. And my, my goal was not to build the biggest payments company in the world. It wasn't to try to climb the Forbes billionaire list. It was, the objective was I want to earn enough money so that I can basically dedicate my attention to doing something that could potentially be useful on a society wide scale. And uh, more importantly, that could be considered to be valuable from the vantage point of 2050, 2100 and 2500. So thinking about it on a, a few hundred year time scale, and there was a certain amount of money I needed to do that. So I didn't require the permission of anybody to do that. And so that what PayPal offered was sufficient for me to, to get that amount of money to basically have a go. And that's when I set off to survey everything I could identify in existence to say of anything in the entire world I could do, what one thing could I do that would actually have the highest value potential for the species? And so it took me a little while to, to arrive at brain interfaces, but. And to be clear, my communication wasn't suggest, wasn't meant to minimize payments yes. or to denigrate it in any way. It was a, an attempted communication that when I was surveying the world, it was an algorithm of what could I individually yes. do? So there's, there are things that exist that have a lot of potential that can be done. And then there's a, a filtering of how many people are qualified to do this given thing. Yes. And then there's 
a further characterization that could be done of, okay, given the number of qualified people, will somebody be uh, a unique outperformer of that group to make something truly impossible to be something done that otherwise couldn't get done? So there's, there's a process of assessing where can you add unique value in the world. That's right. And so we, we were uh, a brain tree. I think we were the first company to integrate Coinbase into our, uh, I think we were the first payments company to formally incorporate uh, crypto, if I'm not mistaken. For people who are not familiar, Coinbase is a place where you can trade cryptocurrencies. Yeah, which was one of the only places you could. So we were early uh, in, in doing that. And of course, this was in the year 2013. So an attorney to go in, in cryptocurrency land. I concur with the the statement you made of the potential of the principles underlying cryptocurrencies. And that many of the things that they're building in the name of money and of, and of, of moving value is equally applicable to the brain and equally applicable to how the brain interacts with the rest of the world and how we would imagine doing goal alignment with people. So it's, to me, it's a continuous spectrum mm -hmm. of possibility. And we're talking, your question is isolated on the money. And right. I think it just is basically a, a scaffolding layer for all of society. So you don't see the, this money as particularly distinct from- I don't, the... it's, I think we, we at Kernel, we will benefit greatly from the progress being made in cryptocurrency because it will be a similar technology stack we will want to use for many things we want to accomplish. And so I'm bullish on what's going on and uh, think it could greatly enhance uh, brain interfaces and the value of the, of the brain interface ecosystem. It's the, it's the same way I think about my diet where previously it was conscious Brian looking at foods in certain biochemical states. Am I hungry? Am I irritated? Am I depressed? And then I choose based upon those momentary windows. Mm -hmm. Do I eat at night when I'm fatigued and I have low willpower? Am I going to pig out on something? And the current monetary system is based upon human conscious decision-making and politics and power and right. this whole mess of things. And what I like about the building blocks of cryptocurrency is it's methodical, it's structured, it is uh, accountable, it's transparent. And so it introduces this scaffolding, which I think again, is the right starting point for how we think about building next generation institutions for society. And that's why I think it's much broader than, much broader than money. Driven. Yes. Yeah, I, I think that is accurate that cryptocurrency is a version of what I would call my autonomous self that I'm trying to build. Yeah. It is an introduction of an autonomous system of value exchange and value and, and the process. Yeah, of value creation in, in society. Yes. I said there's similarities. <sighs> My current protocol is basically the the result of thousands of experiments and uh, decision making. So I've I do this every ninety days. I do the tests. I do the cycle throughs. Then I measure again, and then I'm measuring all the time. And so what I I of course I'm optimizing for my biomarkers. I want perfect cholesterol, and I want perfect bio blood glucose levels, and perfect DNA methylation, uh, you know, processes. Uh, I also want perfect sleep. And so for example, recently in the past two weeks, my resting heart rate has been at 42 when I sleep. And when my resting heart rate is at 42, my HRV is at its highest. And I wake up in the morning feeling more energized than any other configuration. And so I know from all these processes that eating at roughly 8.30 in the morning, right after I work out on an empty stomach, creates enough t a distance between that completed eating and bedtime where I have no, almost no digestion processes going on in my body. Therefore my resting heart rate goes very low. And when my resting heart rate is very low, I sleep with high quality. And so basically I've been trying to optimize the entirety 
of what I eat to my sleep quality. And my sleep quality then, of course, feeds into my willpower, so it creates this virtuous cycle. And so what I, at 8.30, what I do is I eat uh, what I call super veggie, which is it's a pudding of 250 grams of broccoli, 150 grams of cauliflower, and a whole bunch of other vegetables that I eat uh, what I call nutty pudding, which is... High speed you can be made in a high-speed blender. But basically, I eat the same thing every day. A veggie bowl uh, as in the form of pudding and then a bowl in the form of nuts. And then I have... Does it taste dish. good? I love it. I okay. I love it so much, I dream about it. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. This is... Uh... <laughs> and then I have a third dish, which is... It changes every day. Uh, today, it was kale and spinach and sweet potato. And then uh, I take about 20 supplements that hopefully make uh, constitute a perfect nutritional profile. So what I'm trying to do is create the perfect diet for my body every single day. Yeah, you know, Alfred North Whitehead said, uh, civilization advances as it extends the number of important operations it can do without thinking about them. Yes. And so my objective on this is I want an algorithm for perfect health that I never have to think about. Yeah. And then I want that system to be scalable to anybody so that they don't have to think about it. And right now it's expensive for me to do it. It's time consuming for me to do it. And I have infrastructure to do it, but the future of being human is not going to the grocery store and deciding what to eat. It's also not reading scientific papers trying to decide this thing or that thing. It's all N of one. So it's, right. de it's devices on the outside and inside your body assessing real time what your body needs and then creating closed loop systems for that to happen. That's right, because every time I spend time thinking about this or executing, spending time on it, I'm spending less time thinking about yeah. building kernel or, or the future of being human. And so it's we just all have these the budget of our capacity on an on an everyday basis and we will scaffold our way up out of this. And so yeah, hopefully that what I'm doing is really it serves as a model uh that others can also you build on. That's why I, that's why I wrote about it is hopefully people can then take it and improve upon it. Mm -hmm. Uh I hold nothing sacred. I change my diet almost every day based upon some new test result or science or something like that. But mm -hmm. I think sleep is a contender for being the most powerful health intervention in existence. It, it's a contender. I mean, it's uh, it's magical what it does if you're well rested and what your body can do. And I mean, for example, I know when when I eat close to my bedtime, and I've done a systematic study for years, uh, looking at like 15 minute increments on time of day on where I eat my last meal, my willpower is directly correlated to my to the amount of deep sleep I get. So my ability to not binge eat at night when Rascal Brian's out and about is based upon how much deep sleep I got the night before. Yeah, and so yeah, there's some there's a lot to that. Yeah, and so I just I've seen it manifest itself, and so the I think. The way I summarize this is in society, we've had this myth of, we tell stories, for example, of entrepreneurship, where this person was so amazing, they stayed at the office for three days and slept under their desk. Yeah. And we say, wow, that's amazing. There's, that's amazing. And now I think we're headed towards a state where we'd say that's primitive and really not a good idea on every level. And so the new, mythology is going to be the exact opposite. Here's a data point for your consideration. Yes. The progress in biology over the past, say, decade has been stunning. Yes. And it now appears as if we will be able to replace our organs, uh, zero extra uh, transplantation. And so we probably have a path to replace and regenerate every organ of your body, except for your brain. 
You can you can lose your hand and your arm and a leg. You can have an artificial heart. You can't operate without your brain. And so when you make that trade-off decision of whether you're going to sleep under the desk or not and go all out for a four-day marathon, yeah. right? There's a there's a cost-benefit trade-off of what's going what's happening to your brain in that situation. We don't know the consequences of modern day life on our brain. We don't, it's the most valuable organ in our existence. And we don't know what's going on if we, and, and how we're treating it today with stress and with sleep and with dietary. And to me, then if you say that you're trying to, you're, you're trying to optimize life for whatever things you're trying to do. The game is soon, with the progress in anti-aging and biology, the game is very soon going to become different than what it is right now uh, with organ rejuvenation, organ replacement. And I am I would conjecture that we will value the health status of our brain above all things. So... Uh, there's no point to anything I just said, but yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> what, what is the nature of your regret on the brisket? Is it, do you wish you hadn't eaten it entirely? Is it that you wish you hadn't eaten as much as you did? Is it that? As you were explaining your objective function of, for example, in the criteria you were including, you like certain neurochemical states like you like feeling like you're living life that life has enjoyment that sometimes you want to disregard certain rules to have a moment of passion of focus there's this architecture of the way lex is which makes you happy as a story you tell as something you kind of experience maybe it's the experience is a bit more complicated but it's in this idea you have this is a version of you and the reason why i maintain the schedule i do is I've chosen a game to say, I would like to live a life where I care more about what intelligent, what people who live in 2000, the year 2500 think of me than I do today. That's the game I'm trying to play. And so therefore, the only thing I really care about on this optimization is trying to see past myself past my limitations, using zeroth principle thinking, pull myself out of this contextual mesh we're in right now and say, what will matter 100 years from now and 200 years from now? What are the big things really going on that are defining reality? And I find that if I were to hang out with Diet Soda Lex, and Diet Soda Brian were to play along with that, and my deep sleep were to get crushed as a result, my mind would not be on what matters in 100 years or 200 years or 300 years. I would be irritable. I would be, you know, I'd be in a different state. And so it's just gameplay selection. It's what you and I have chosen to think about. It's what we've chosen to uh, work on. And uh, this is why I'm saying that no generation of humans have ever been afforded the opportunity to look at their lifespan and contemplate that they will have the possibility of experiencing an evolved form of consciousness that is unidentifiable, that would fall in a zeroth category of uh, potential. That to me is the most exciting thing in existence. And I would not trade any momentary neurochemical state right now in exchange for that, I would, I'd be willing to deprive myself of all momentary joy in, in the pursuit of that goal, because that's what makes me happy. Really what you're saying though, if we're looking at this, let's say from a first principles perspective, when you read those words, they conjure up certain life experiences, but you're basically saying, I experience a certain neurotransmitter state when these things are in action. That's all you're saying. So whether it's that or something else, you're just saying right. you have a selection for how you, your state for your body. And so if you as an engineer of, of consciousness, that should just be engineerable. Yeah. I and mean, that's just triggering certain chemical reactions. Yeah. And so whether, exactly. so it doesn't mean they have to be mutually exclusive. You can have that and experience that and also 
not sacrifice long-term health. And I think that's the potential of where we're going is we don't have we don't have to assume they are trade-offs that must be had. Yeah, and I find like my personal experience in thinking about hard things is like oftentimes I feel like I'm I'm looking through a telescope and like I'm aligning two or three telescopes and you kind of have to like close one eye and move it back and forth a little bit and just find just the right alignment and you find just a sneak peek at the thing you're trying to find, but it's fleeting. If you move just one little bit, it's gone. Yeah. And oftentimes the, what I feel like are the high, the ideas I value the most are like that. They're so fragile and fleeting and slippery and elusive and it requires a sensitivity to thinking and a sensitivity to maneuver through these things. If I concede to uh, a world where I'm on my phone texting, I'm also on social media, I'm also doing 15 things at the same time because I'm running a company and I'm also feeling terrible from the last night, um, it all just comes crashing down and the quality of my thoughts goes to a zero. I'm just a, I'm a functional person to respond to basic level things, but I don't feel like I am doing anything interesting. I guess the backstory is relevant because that, uh, in that moment, it was the darkest time in my life. I was ending a 13 year marriage. I was leaving my religion. I sold Braintree and I was come, I, battling depression where I was just like, at the end. And I got invited to go to Tanzania as part of a group that was raising money to build clean water wells. And I had made some money from Braintree. And so I was able to donate $25,000. And it was the first time I had ever had money to donate outside of paying tithing in my religion. And it was such a phenomenal experience to, to contribute something meaningful to someone else in that form. And as part of this process, we were going to climb the mountain. And so we went there and we saw the clean water wells we were building. We, we spoke to the, the people there and it was very energizing. And then we climbed Kilimanjaro and I came down with uh, a stomach flu on, on day three. And I also had altitude sickness, but I became so sick that on day four, we are somebody on day five, I came into the camp, base camp at 15,000 feet, uh, just, you know, going to the bathroom on myself and like falling all over. It was just, it was just I was just a disaster. Uh, I was so sick. So stomach flu and altitude sickness. Mm -hmm. it, I, okay. Yeah. And I just was destroyed uh, from the situation. And plus it was psychologically one of the lowest points. I, yeah. And I think that was probably a big contributor. I was, I was just smoked as a human, just absolutely done. And I had three young children. And so I was trying to reconcile, like, I, this is not, a, whether what whether I live or not is not my decision by itself. I'm now intertwined with these three little people and I have an obligation whether I like it or not, I need to be there. And so it did, it felt like I was just stuck in a straitjacket. And I had to decide whether I was going to summit the next day with the, the team. And it was a difficult decision because once you start hiking, there's no way to get off the mountain and a midnight came and our guide came in and he said, where are you at? And I said, I think I'm okay. I think I can try. And so we, we went. And so from midnight to, I made it to the summit at 5 a.m. Uh, it was one of the most transformational moments of my existence. And the mountain became my problem. It became everything that I was struggling with. And when I started hiking, it was it, the pain got so ferocious uh, that it was kind of like this. The uh, it became so ferocious that um, I turned my music to Eminem, and it was you know Eminem was is the he was the only person in existence that spoke to my soul, <laughs> and it was something about you know his anger and his vibrancy and his multi-dimensionally he's the only person I, who I could turn on and I could say, ah, oh, like I feel some relief. 
I turned, I turned on Eminem and um, I made it to the summit uh, after five hours. Uh, but just a just hundred yards from the top, I was with my guide Ike and I started getting very dizzy and I, was gonna, I felt like I was going to fall backwards off this, this cliff area we were on. I was like, this is dangerous. And uh, he said, look, Brian, I, I know where you're at. He's like, I've, I know where you're at. And I can tell you, you've got it in you. So I want you to look up, take a step, take a breath and look up, take a breath and take a step. And I did. And uh, I made it. And so I got there and I just, I sat down with him at the top. And I just cried like a baby. <laughs> Broke down. <laughs> did just, I just <laughs> lost it. And uh, so, you know, he let me do my thing. And then we pulled out the, the pulse oximeter and he measured my blood oxygen levels. And it's like, it was like 50 something percent and it was danger zone. So he, so he looked at it and I think he was like really alarmed <laughs> that I was in this situation. And so uh, he said, we can't get a helicopter here and we can't get you emergency evacuated. You've got to go down. You've got to hike down to 15,000 feet to get base camp. And so he, we went out of the mountain. I got back, got back down to base camp. And um, again, that was pretty difficult. And then they put me on a stretcher, this metal stretcher with this one wheel and a team of six people wheeled me down the mountain. And uh, it was it was pretty torturous. I'm very appreciative they did. Also, the trail was very bumpy, so they'd go over these big rocks, and so my head would just slam against this metal thing uh, for hours. And so I just felt awful. Plus, I'd get my head slammed every couple seconds. Yeah. So the whole experience uh, was really a life changing moment, and that's it. That was the demarcation of me basically building a new life. Of uh, basically, I said I'm going to reconstruct Brian. My my understanding of reality, my existential reality is what I want to go after. And I try, I mean, as much as that's possible as a human, but that's when I set out to rebuild everything. For me, it felt like I was just locked in with reality and it was a death match. It was in that moment, one of us is gonna die. So you were pondering death. Yeah. Like not surviving. Yeah. And, and it was, and that was the moment. And it was, uh, the summit to me was, I, I'm gonna come out on top and I can do this. And uh, giving in was, it's like, I'm just done. And so it did, I locked in and uh, that's why, yeah, m mountains are magical to me. Uh, I didn't expect that. I didn't design that. I didn't know that was gonna be the case. I, I not, it would not have been something I would have anticipated. Yes, I would say listen to advice and see it for what it is, a mirror of that person, and then map and know that your future is going to be in a zeroth principle land. And so the, what you're hearing today is a representation of what may have been the right principles to build upon previously, but they're likely depreciating very fast. And so I am a strong proponent that people ask for advice, but they don't take advice. So how do you take advice properly? It's in the careful examination of the advice. It's, it's actually, you, the person makes a statement about a given thing somebody should follow. The value is not doing that. The value is understanding the assumption stack they built, the assumption and knowledge right. stack they built around that, that body of knowledge. That's the value. It's not doing what they say. Uh, the most significant moments of my memory, uh, for example, like on Kilimanjaro, when Ike, some person I'd never met in Tanzania, was able to, in that moment, apparently see my soul when I was in this death match with reality. Yes. And he gave me the instructions, look up, step. And so there's magical people in my life that have done things like that. And I suspect they probably don't know. I, I, I probably should be better at identifying those things. And, but yeah, hopefully the, I suppose like a wisdom I would aspire to is to have the awareness and the empathy to be that for other people mm. and not a 
a retail advertiser of advice of tricks and for life, but uh, deeply meaningful and empathetic uh, with a one-on-one -on -one context with people that it really can make a difference. Yeah, I think the answer to this question, again, the information value is more in the mirror it provides of that person, which is a representation of the technological, social, political context of the time. So if you ask this question 100 years ago, you would get a certain answer that reflects that time period. Same thing would be true for 1,000 years ago. It's rare. It's difficult for a person to pull themselves out of their contextual awareness yeah, very true. and offer a truly original response. And so knowing that I am contextually influenced by the situation, that I am a mirror for our reality, I would say that in this moment, I think the real game going on is that in evolution built a system of scaffolding intelligence that produced us. We are now building intelligence systems that are scaffolding higher dimensional intelligence. Uh, it, it's developing more robust systems of intelligence. In doing in that process, with the cost going to zero, then the meaning of life becomes goal alignment, which is the negotiation of our conscious and unconscious existence. And then I'd say the third thing is, if we're thinking that we want to be explorers, is our technological progress is getting to a point where we could aspirationally say, we want to figure out what is really going on really going on because does any of this really make sense now we may be 100 200 500 a thousand years away from being able to poke our way out of whatever is is going on but it's interesting that we could even state an aspiration to say we want to poke at this question but i'd say in this moment of time the meaning of life is that we can build a future state of existence that is more fantastic than anything we could ever imagine. The striving for something more amazing. And that defies expectations that we would consider bewildering and all the things that, that that's, and, and, and I guess the last thing, <laughs> if there's multiple meanings of life, it would be infinite games. You know, James Cars wrote the book, Finite Games, Infinite Games. Mm -hmm. The only game to play right now is to keep playing the game. And so this is, goes back to the algorithm of the Lex algorithm of diet soda and brisket and okay. pursuing the passion. I'm, what I'm suggesting is there is a, there's a moment here where we can contemplate playing infinite games. Therefore, it may make sense to err on the side of making sure one is in a situation to be playing infinite games if that opportunity arises. So it's just the landscape of possibilities changing very, very fast. And therefore our, our old algorithms of how we might assess risk assessment and what things we might pursue and why those assumptions may fall away very quickly. This is the Lex Free Podcast.